Well, welcome back to Civically Minded. I'm your host, Corey Wing. On today's episode, I have pastor, author, and president of Family Fortress Ministries, Sam Wood. You'll be encouraged and challenged to hear some of the stories and the advice that Sam brings to the table after more than 30 years of family ministry. His organization, Family Fortress, has free resources available for those looking to get married, couples that are currently married or have been married for many, many years, and parents who are looking for better biblical and spiritual advice on how to parent their children in a godly fashion. All of that and more coming up on today's episode of Civically Minded. Well, welcome back to Civically Minded. I'm your host, Corey Wing. As advertised yesterday in my brief podcast, I'm today going to be interviewing uh, founder and president of Family Fortress Ministries. He's also an ordained minister, Pastor Sam Wood. He he works as a parachurch organization, again, Family Fortress Ministries. They come alongside a lot of churches and, and also just congregation members there locally where they're at, and I'll let him get into kind of where they're located and, and kind of their ministry parameters uh, when we bring him on here in just a second. But they, they've they been in ministry for over 20 years. Um, just full disclosure, I am on their board of directors. I also have known their family for, golly, probably pushing 30 years. Um, good friends of my parents and uh, just longtime family friends. But I've also got to know them in a way to know their their character and their decency and their walk with Christ. So I can, in full confidence, um, highly suggest Family Fortress Ministries and and Sam and Debbie Wood as true faithful ministers of the gospel and and folks that really have helped not just uh, me personally over the years but hundreds and hundreds if not thousands of of marriages and and folks to walk through very sensitive topics. So without further ado, um, it's founder, president, and ordained minister Sam Wood. Sam, it's it's yes. wonderful to have you this morning. Oh, it's great to be with you, uh, Corey. I uh, appreciate uh, this opportunity and honored to be on your show. Thank you very much. Uh, just to get started, I want I want to give you a little bit of time to to just tell us a little bit about what Family Fortress Ministries is, kind of what ministry are you involved in, and and what you're all about. Yeah, we founded Family Fortress Ministries uh, really around 1990, so we've been doing this over 30 years, and our heartbeat is really to see uh, revival in our families. We began to see the family breakdown, marriage breakdown in the 80s, 70s, 80s. And uh, God really placed a strong burden on my heart to try to make a difference uh, by proclaiming the gospel and, and what the Bible says about marriage, about family, and to see uh, really revival in our homes. We would talk so much about having revival in our churches, but I began to think, you're not going to have revival in your churches till you first have it in your homes. It starts in each individual family within the church. And so God placed on my heart and my wife's heart a burden to really reach out to families, hurting families uh, that need help and also families that just need guidance biblically to really have a, uh, you know, a joyful relationship in Christ in their marriage. I, I think of the verse in Ecclesiastes 9.9, 9, and I've kind of used it many, many years where the Solomon in his older age looks back and he says, live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of thy youth. And he's saying that marriage should be a joyful uh, experience. Family should be a joyful experience. And we got two sinners living together, so it creates problems. But, you know, we have Christ. So how can we have a Christ-centered relationship at home uh, so that when the world looks at us, uh, we're not just like the world. They see something very different because the world is looking for answers. So that's kind of been our heartbeat over the years and uh, trying to uh, help families in many, many different ways that way. So I know over the years you've conducted uh, marriage enrichment weekends and workshops, even retreats and things like that. Are you still doing any of those types of events as well? Uh, you know, we are uh, probably not to the extent that we used to do it. We might do 30 or 40 of those type of events a year. Now we're probably doing more like uh, 15 or 20. Uh, but we are still doing a lot of different marriage conferences and uh, parenting conferences. A lot of times I go to churches and just preach on the family and teach on the family. So uh, that's our heartbeat. But we have expanded our outreach to other mediums and ways to connect in the day and as things are changing today 
uh, to reach people even in ways that aren't in the church. So uh, we're thankful for the technological uh, opportunities we have today to do that. Excellent. Excellent. So now that's all fine and well for folks that, you know, maybe are married or have been married. Um, what about, say, you know, I say young couple, but I suppose older folks get married as well. Um, a, a couple that has not yet married, they're heading in that direction, uh, but but they're not married yet. Do you do any kind of premarital or, or you know, counseling for folks that are that are headed toward marriage? Uh, you know, we do, and I have a, a strong burden for that because uh, I think just like uh, some people might plan a vacation and look at all the brochures, all the pictures online and everything else, and and they save their money and everything, prepare for a foundation to have a great vacation. Uh, there's nothing more important in, in really this life, if you're, if you're going to have a relationship with someone else in marriage, uh, than preparing for it. And that's something most people don't do. You're talking about age of married couples and average couple getting married today is about 30, which is increased. It's continually increasing as far as age. But I found in going to many, many churches, especially smaller churches that do not have uh, a, a counselor, but maybe just a pastor that they are not equipped or don't have time to do premarital training. So uh, years ago, uh, about 10 years ago now, it's hard to believe, but we came up with, uh, my wife has a degree in computer science, I've got a degree in engineering. So we kind of put some thinking together and thought, how can we help come beside churches and training couples uh, to prepare to have a Christ-centered marriage? So we developed a online premarital training program called Preparing for Partnership. It has seven lessons and it's something that uh, couples can take each lesson. It's various uh, dynamic platforms, a teaching platform with videos, hundreds of questions that are asked to them. After they finish a lesson, they get a individual email assessment of that lesson. Each one of them, they get a couple assessment that compares their answers and the counselor, if it's a pastor or whoever that might be, also can get a counseling assessment email that says they've taken this lesson and these are everything looks good, or these are some areas that maybe you need to talk with them about. Uh, so it gives a tool to the church. And we have hundreds of churches, several hundred churches using this now uh, to train uh, young couples to prepare for marriage, to have a Christ-centered marriage. So I strongly believe in that, but we didn't just believe in it. We wanted to do something that we would, could put feet to it and really make a difference. And so that is av available, even if you just are a couple out there looking for premarital training, you don't have nowhere to go to get it. You can go to preparingforpartnership.org, your website, and uh, you can register there, take the take the lessons. You, a church can register there free. All of it's free. We just go by donations. So that's kind of been our heartbeat is to train and equip young couples. What an amazing resource yeah. to, to have available yeah. and, and all for free. That's really, a, a, a like you said, in, we're living in a day and age where uh, things like that are possible. I, I I can't imagine even at my age, none of that existed, you know, 25, 30, 40 years ago. And and so thank you for, as the times have changed, thank you for for being um, kind of pliable enough to change with, with them. That's, that's an amazing thing for ministers to be able to provide these days. Uh, but so, so you're helping these young couples are again thirty somethings, which is when my wife and I got married. We were in our thirties, and and helping those folks along. But we all know that even among Christians, as you said earlier, it's two sinners living together. There are real issues that do come up, even within Christian households, Christian marriages. Um, some of that might be because you didn't lay a, a really good foundation, or maybe you were married as non-believers and you got married after you. Oh, pardon me, you came to Christ after you got married. Um, or, or again, even though the Bible says we shouldn't do it, maybe uh, you were married um, as a believer and a non-believer, or you know, any number of things. So, so real issues do come up in marriage, even amongst Christians. Uh, do you offer some kind of um, counseling and things like that for folks that are, you know, say, say they've been married 10 years, 15 years, but they're now up against something, uh, maybe due to a job, maybe due to a health crisis, maybe due to just children, you know, and 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 they've got yeah. a child that's wayward and it's caused real marital friction. Do you offer that type of service as well? Uh, yeah, you know, we certainly do. We um, it's 
of course, limited in the fact that we are on the road some teaching, preaching, and things like that. But we do, do 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 a lot of counseling. I've got a we've got a young couple in their twenties actually coming tomorrow afternoon to spend several hours from. They're coming from several uh, uh, spend several hours with us, but they're coming from several hours away driving in, and uh, we're going to spend uh, some time trying to help them work through some issues as a young Christian couple, uh, in counseling them. So. Uh, we, we, I guess I would call it more discipleship than I would even counseling. We try to disciple these young couples and try to help them, whether it's a husband and wife, uh, with any issues they may face. Locally, we do a lot of counseling or discipleship with, uh, Debbie does with women, I do with men, uh, whether they're dealing with porno, whether they're dealing with other issues they may have. Uh, so we do a lot of that type of thing uh, pretty much continually, yeah. Excellent. And online, we have people that will send a question in online. We'll uh, we'll do whatever we can to help address that question, and give them answers and help. So, I'm I'm glad you brought that up. Um, of course, with this platform that that I use here on YouTube, but also I have an Instagram, a, a, an X or Twitter account, whatever people are still calling it these days. Um, you know, and and for those of us that do ministerial work, and we do it online to where it's broadcast, you know, not just within our community, or not even just within America, but really globally. Um, one of the things that I've seen other pastors do that, that, that I have found very helpful for anyone that's doing any type of ministry um, in, a, in a broad platformed way like this is to set proper expectations, or at least this is something I've found helpful for myself, is, is being able to go back to folks in, in a private conversation, maybe they've emailed you or direct messaged you on Twitter, and you can go back and say, look, I am happy to talk through some of these topics with you. However, I encourage you to find a local Bible preaching, Bible believing church, a pastor that will, will come alongside you and actually be able to provide you local pastoring um, who, can, who can really dig into the situation in a way that I, from wherever I am and wherever you are, am going to be limited in doing. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad you brought that out because, you know, even the couple coming, I mentioned coming tomorrow, uh, we'll get permission from their, I felt like I need to get permission from their pastor uh, and talk to him and let him know that I'm counseling somebody in his church and I, I don't pastor them. Uh, so I think there is some uh, awareness that needs to be made there if I'm doing that. And I also do encourage uh, couples or people at a distance to find someone, as you said, that is biblically based that can really be helped to them and connecting with them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, certainly that's good. Now we do do counseling and have done quite a bit over FaceTime, Zoom, whatever that may look like, but still it's, it means so much to be there in person uh, and to try to help somebody. So even a, a couple that's distant, if they come to us, we're going to ask them uh, to come the first session one-on-one -on -one to be in person with us at our home. And then we may do sessions after that through FaceTime or Zoom or something. But the first session, we want it to be face-to-face. Uh, -face. So it's, it's very good you mentioned that, yeah. Well, that's helpful. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, you've been doing this, like you said, over 30 years. That's, that's a long time. And culture, of course, uh, has changed dramatically over 30 years. I'm 46, and I've seen in my own lifetime that Overton window seems to constantly slide leftward. And so I'm curious in your capacity as, as you know, family minister and kind of a counselor and, and a pastor that has spoke to these issues for this long, what are some issues that you have seen increase in recent years in your counseling sessions? And again, I, I don't mean to pry into anyone's particular personal life or, or divulge anything that you're not supposed to, obviously, but are, do you see patterns that have emerged where there are sin issues now that you see cropping up over and over and over that maybe you didn't see even five, 10 years ago? You know, I, I would think as you ask that, that there's over the last 30, 40 years, there's quite a few things that happen in our culture that I think have affected even, if you want to say Christian couples in the church, one of them uh, I think is, is there's been a major loss in the sacredness of marriage. Mm. That is looking at marriage as something that is very, very sacred. I think I think of Hebrews 13, 4, where it says that God says we're to hold marriage in honor among all 
They were an honor kid, mean precious. Well, marriage is to be precious among all. That is, whether you're old, whether you're young, whether you're a child, whatever age you may be, a teenager, I think we've lost that. We've lost that in the land, in the secular culture that we're living in now. Uh, and it's, it's a very, very harmful thing. And that creeps into the church too, where that marriage now, even in the church with many couples going to what we might call Bible preaching churches are living together and they're not married. And it's, it's, it's a loss of the sacred institution of marriage. There's a new book I highly recommend it by Brad Wilcox, who uh, speaks on these subjects. He's a professor at the University of Virginia, but it's the title of the book is Get Married. And, you know, he, um, I've got it right here. And he, he, the subtitle is Why Americans Must Defy the Elites, Forge Strong Families, and Save, notice that, Save Civilization. Wow. Um, it's, it's a powerful book, and he's putting a lot of statistics and numbers to what he's saying. And I, I pulled out a couple of quotes here I'll just share. He says, there's a growing list of progressive journalists, professors, and other professionals celebrating singleness, childlessness, and divorce in the pages of other prominent publications from the Atlantic. They, have one, uh, they had an article called The Case Against Marriage to Time Magazine, Having It All Without Having Children, to the New York Times, Divorce Can Be an Act of Radical Self-Love. Uh, taken together, he says, these elite messaging, largely from the left, leaves a distinct impression that the path to prosperity, a meaningful life, and happiness leads away from family formation and towards single, singledom, work and travel, work hard, play hard, stay single, keep your options open. Above all, make your life about, get this, self-love. Mm -hmm. But he proves in this book, and that's why I like the book, he says, being married is a better predictor, and this is, he's got numbers to this, is a better predictor of happiness than other factors that get more attention in today's culture like education, work, money, race, and gender. And marital quality is far and away the top predictor I have run across of life satisfaction in America, specifically the odds that men and women, listen to this, the odds that men and women say they are very happy with their lives are a staggering 545% higher for those who are very happily married compared to their peers who are not married or who are less than very happy in their marriages. Uh, it, you know, just again, proving that uh, marriage is foundational to civilization. And we've lost that in the, this culture that we're living. We're told that it's uh, self-love. You know, it's all mm -hmm. about me. And that has crept, and here's another issue that's crept, I think, into our, our problems today, even into the church, is we've lost an understanding of what it means to live in a marriage covenant. And many young couples, when they come and get counseling and have problems, many marriages have problems, they're living contractually, not covenantially. And uh, they got a list, a mental list of expectations for each other. If you do this, you do that, then I'll do this and do this. If you don't, I won't. Uh, and they accept each other based on what they do or don't do. And if they don't do what they want them to do, they think to themselves, well, it's okay. I can just get a divorce and I'll go find somebody else who meets my needs. And so it's a whole different concept of understanding biblically what it means to live in covenant where you have the grace of God. Uh, you know, when, when, somebody, when somebody, your wife or husband isn't loving you right, that you still can love them right and be the husband and wife you need to be for them, even when they're not that for you. So I think there's a real loss in that also. And, and I'd say there's, there's one other thing as, as uh, we think about this question. Uh, I think we, we don't have any margin anymore. Uh, and and I, I say that uh, because I read a book and because I've been, I did a Bible study uh, with 10 men on romance and sex and marriage. And it's interesting because some of them came back doing parts of this and said, because, uh, you know, we don't have time to have sex. I mean, it kind of blew me away. We don't have time to have sex in a marriage, uh, we have romance in a marriage. And, and I thought, wow, that's a real problem. And so I thought about a book I'd heard of before by Richard Swenson called Margin. And uh, he says in this book, you know, that we've embraced a culture uh, that is, he calls marginless living. Listen to what he says. He says, progress has given us unprecedented affluence, education, technology, and entertainment. 
we have comforts and conveniences other eras can only dream of it. Yet somehow, we're not flourishing under the gifts of modernity as one would expect. We find ourselves in the midst of an unnamed epidemic. The disease of marginless living is insidious, widespread, and virulent. People are tired and frazzled. People are anxious and depressed. People don't have time. Listen, people don't have time to heal anymore. To be sure, the pains of the past were often horrible beyond description. Have your wife die at childbirth, your children crippled with polio, your cattle ravaged by tuberculosis, and your crops leveled by locusts is not the common definition of the good life. But those were the pains of the past, and most of them are gone. Unfortunately and unexpectedly, the pains of progress are now here to take their place. Pains of progress and interesting. Prominent among them is the disease of marginless living. And basically, if you read this book, I haven't finished it actually, but if you read it, it's we don't have time to breathe anymore. Mm. People don't take. I have couples, you wouldn't believe this. I have couples that come sometimes and they'll contact us about getting counseling because their marriage is about to fall apart. And we try to schedule a time for counseling. They don't have time. They can't find the time. Their children are playing so many sports. They're working jobs. They can't find a time to even come and get help. There's not enough margin in their life to even do that. There's no margin to take a walk together in their marriage. There's no margin to sit on the front porch and have a 30 minute talk with each other. Uh, we're living, so that, I've seen that to be a something that's just crept up in our society in the last 20 through 30 years. It's a major, major problem with Christian couples. No, I, I, that is extremely good and, and a, a, a good word because I couldn't agree with you more. I of course, teach uh, uh, an adult Sunday school class at our own church, and I'm now preaching once a month um, as as well. So as I'm under care of our presbytery heading towards full ordination, I'm increasingly doing some of this type of work myself, and I can't agree more. I, I say to our own congregation um, often, especially my Sunday school class, which is made up of a lot of these young couples you're speaking of, and and they'll miss church frequently during a certain sports season or, you know, and, and I caution them and, and I'm not saying that they don't feel a, a certain amount of guilt or, or shame over doing it, but apparently not enough to completely radically change their actions. And then I tell them from time to time, remember what it is you're teaching your children, you know, that, that you may say God is the most important thing in our lives, but when you dishonor his day, and again, this makes me a lot more Reformed and Presbyterian, but um, being being more Sabbatarian. But again, I do think that there's some wisdom there, that God, in his wisdom, gave us the creation ordinance of Sabbath. He certainly didn't need the rest. It's not like the seventh day rolled around and he said, well, I'm tired. He was establishing something for us, you know, and, and when... Absolutely. When you hear about this no margin idea that that we just don't have time for even each other, well, that creeps into we don't have time for God. And as I've been catechizing our young children and taking them through the Westminster, their favorite catechism question, maybe because it's the easiest so far, but their favorite one is just the first question. You know, what is the chief end of man? And the Westminster divines would say the chief end of man is to enjoy God and glorify or glorify God and enjoy him forever. Pardon me. And, and when I hear someone like Pastor Rick Warren, who, again, done much for the Lord, um, has been a blessing to many, but just recently was on TBN and said that the, the, basically the chief end of man is to be loved by God, that flips that on its head. You know, it's not really? for us to love God. No, 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 no. It's for God mm -hmm. to love us. Well, if, if we can make even our relationship with Christ about us, and and not about him, then why not our marriages? Why not our children? Why not, you know, our our whatever, fill in the blank. You know, it, it all becomes so navel gazing that that it's so toxic to any kind of healthy relationship, first Godward, of course, but then with every horizontal relationship thereafter. So I wanna I I, I appreciate uh, again kind of talking about that. I I think this kind of leads into something that that I wanted to talk about. Um and spend a little bit of time if if we can, because I've seen this in our church. I've seen this in in some of the you know people that we have very close personal relationships with. Um, you know, I've got family members that struggle with this, but I have seen a major increase in you know Christian depression or or Christian anxiety. 
Um, I've seen a ton of it in the aftermath of COVID-19. I'm not, I, I don't want to necessarily say there's a causation there, though there might be, uh, that, that the isolation that that bred and things like that. But I've seen a huge uptick in our circles with Christian anxiety, Christian depression. Um, would, would that be something that you see, or pardon me, that you would say that you have seen in in your familial and, and counseling efforts uh, among Christians, especially that are just struggling with this crippling depression or this almost overwhelming anxiety. You know, absolutely. And I, uh, it's interesting you bring that up because I would, I would say probably 50% of the counseling we do deals with what uh, Martin Lloyd Jones would call spiritual depression. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Christians who uh, have, even as the Psalms would say, a crushed spirit, uh, they feel like they have lost their um, reason for living in life. Uh, they uh, are depressed. They're anxious uh, for whatever reasons that may be. Uh, and uh, so they're having, really have struggling just living. And, you know, it's, it's, we, it's, kind, of a, it's kind of the uh, opposite of what we should be as a Christian because we have Christ. And so anytime that we go out in the world and people see us, and we look like we're winged on a pickle as a Christian or something. If you wanted to say that, or we look depressed, looks anxious, we look like, well, I don't know how I'm going to make it to the next day. It's a real indictment against and, and bad testimony as a Christian against, uh, you know, having, calling yourself a Christian or, or, or trying to reflect Christ in a world that is dark and needs light. And so, but we are people, we still have a flesh, we still have an enemy. And we, I think that's one of the things people to realize we have an enemy who hates us. Uh, the devil hates us. And if he can't take your salvation, but he'll do everything he can to make you ineffective and as miserable as you possibly can be. Uh, I think of, um, you know, we can think of, of people in the Bible, uh, young Timothy. I mean, Paul wrote first and second Timothy basically because of Timothy's fears and anxiety, he was a young preacher and he was nervous. And he had a case, what I would call, of the what ifs. What if this happens? What if you die, Paul? What if this happens? What if this happens? And I come across so many people in, in, in counseling and, and it is, they're, they're sitting here, well, what if this? What if that? Especially in the last 10, 15 years with COVID, the economy, everything. Uh, you know, this happening right now and around us. And so they get caught up in this, and it's very, very depressing. We see David in Psalm 42, and he's asking the question, you know, why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Uh, he's, he's asking himself, why am I cast down? Why am I depressed? Why am I anxious? So this isn't limited uh, to what we might say um, uh, just a few people that are Christians, but even some of the greatest Christians who've ever lived deal with depression, spiritual depression, anxiety, and all these types of issues. So it's a major, major problem. What advice, because um, I would agree with you, Pastor, that, that this is a, and again, not a uniquely modern problem, as you said, that there, there are biblical authors that very much dealt with this, but what advice would you give to maybe someone watching today who, who says, I know I'm a Christian. I, I know that I'm in covenant with Christ and, and he died for my sins. And, and I know that should make a bigger difference for my mental and, and, and emotional well-being and, and my mental health than currently it is making. Um, what advice could you give that, that, that man or woman, or maybe even young person that, that might be watching this, who says, I'm just gripped within this stronghold of anxiety or with this with this stronghold of depression and and i don't even know where to start what what advice would you give them you know that's a big question and we could spend hours answering that question but i'm going to just try to maybe give a few quick uh thoughts in regard to that i, I think back to the passage of psalm 42 i just mentioned with uh, king david and of all people you think david he's cast down he's depressed he's in this a pit and uh but the thing that david does is the thing that every christian needs to do in these times he, instead of listening to himself he starts talking to himself and that is huge i, I know one of the 
uh, Martin Lloyd Jones has a book called Spiritual Depression, and he, he he really goes through this passage in Psalm 42 just very very well. I highly recommend the book. And that's something I probably would supplement my teaching with them with, uh, you know. But he talks about in this book the fact that David is talking to himself. You know, we, instead of listening to himself, I mean, I, I hope you understand what I'm saying. Every morning I can get up early in the morning, and if I'm not you know, I have these stray thoughts that start speaking to me, and most of them are negative. About who I'm not worthy, I'm not good, you can't do this. When you realize we have an enemy who's going to try to attack your mind and heart all the time. And if we listen to it, these lies, many of them are just lies. If we listen to that, it's very depressing. And so I didn't ask for those thoughts to come in my mind this morning when I woke up at four o'clock or five o'clock. I didn't ask for it, they just were there. So what I do, I gotta not listen to that. I gotta start talking to myself and reminding myself of the truth. And that's exactly what David does. He says, why are they cast down on my soul? He's talking to himself. He's asking, why am I feeling this way? Why am I hurting? Why am I depressed? Why am I anxious? You know, he's, then he says, hope thou in God. I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance. I need to look and remind myself I love this. I need to remind myself of who I am. Mm. <laughs> you know, and, that, and that's, what, um, that's what Paul does in Ephesians 4. If you remember in the verses in Ephesians 4, he will go into the verses there uh, where he says, put off uh, and put on, put off the old man, put on the new man. And uh, he's saying uh, in between those verses, he says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. I think it's Ephesians 4, 17, 18, something like that. I think it's 4, 17. But he says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And he's not talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the power behind your mind. Your, it's really, uh, it's rem, is being renewed, just like it says in Romans uh, 12, 1. Be renewed by stirring your mind up to remember who you are. And that's really what it is. He says, you need to be reminded of who you are. Quit acting like who you were and be who you are. And, and that's a that's a huge, huge uh, thing. It's kind of like you go to an adult and you ever, maybe some of y'all listening or maybe you've done this court before and, yeah, and you look at somebody and you say, quit acting like a baby. And you're, yeah. you're not talking to a baby. You're talking to an adult. Yeah, grow up. They're not, grow up. They're not being who they are. An adult. Think like a baby. So, you know, in Christianity, Paul is continually reminding us be who you are. Quit acting like who you aren't. Be who you are. Recognize who you are. Here, David in Psalm 42 is, again, he said, I need to remind myself who I am in Christ. I need to remind myself. I would take, you know, somebody to Ephesians 1 and say, listen, let's read through this chapter. Remind yourself you were chosen of God. Remind yourself you're accepted in the beloved. Remind yourself you're adopted in the family of God. Remind yourself you're cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Remind yourself that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, and if you do that, it changes you. Uh, you know, I have to preach the gospel to myself every day. Every Christian needs to do that. Preach the truth. Talk to yourself. Quit listening to yourself. Now, um, and again, I might take him to a passage in First Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6 and 7 where Paul tells young Timothy, he says, stir up a gift within you. God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but he gave you a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Mm -hmm. So again, he's reminding him, stir up the gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit within you. Remember who you are. Remember you have God's spirit within you. So I'm going to go to some passages like that, go to some teaching like that to try to really help them in these times. Yeah, again, that's extremely helpful. I, I know for me, I was probably in my late 20s, maybe even early 30s, when that passage in, in Romans chapter 12 you brought up really started to make sense. For so many years, even in my younger adult life, I thought, that that was one of the most nonsensical passages in all of the New Testament, because here Paul is saying to the Roman believers, change your actions by first changing your mind. And as human beings, especially within a postmodern era, I think 
we think all the time, well, if I can just turn over a new leaf, you know, if I, if I can change my routine, yeah. if I can get up earlier, get to the gym a little more, if I can clean up my diet, if I can, you know, X, Y, Z, if I can do all of these things, yeah. these exterior things, then my mental attitude will shift. When Paul says to the Roman church, no, 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 you've got this backwards. If, if you'll start to clean up your mind and you'll renew your mind, then your actions will have nothing left to do but follow. Because because how could they do anything else? And I think of a passage um, also in Second Corinthians chapter ten where he's you know writing the Corinthian church who had really had some significant problems, and he says that you know the Spirit of God gives us power to to tear down strongholds. You know that mm. that he's not given us a spirit of fear, but but this the, that the spirit that is to tear down these these strongholds that come up in our lives, and and that we are to take even our thoughts captive. Yeah. That's right. You know, and and I think as a man, especially, not that women don't, I think women actually uniquely struggle with anxiety in some ways that men don't. But but I do think men, uh, through the feminization of the church and through the whole feminization of, of Western culture, um, have been so emasculated that the idea of of you know conquering anything, you know, and 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 kind of taking ground yeah. to, to put it in more kind of battle terminology, you know, which, which is central to a man's heart. There there's um, the, the old book by John Eldridge um, wild at heart, which I don't agree with every premise um, that, that John Eldridge puts forward in that book, but there is much of that book that I do think is helpful because he says, look, men, you were created to be men, you know, and, and um, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, there's uh, pastor Michael Foster just a couple of years ago, put out a book called it's good to be a man again, kind of similar themes in that as well of, God would make more women if he wanted more women, but he he uniquely made men to be men. And so the idea of capturing, you know, uh, um, even your stray thoughts, I, I think of, you know, as a young boy playing the game, capture the flag, you know, or, or like yeah. paintball or something like that. And, and that there are these places within your mind that have just become strongholds for the evil one. And if you, through the power of the Spirit and through you know the the regular reading of the Word and prayer, can go back in and and you know stake your flag back in that dark recess of your mind, then the authority of Scripture says, well, then you'll start to reclaim territory, you know. And 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 I think that. So thank you for saying that. I, I that and and you said that that one little couplet um, that Paul reiterates over and over and over in the New Testament. You said in Christ. And and I think again, there's if we could really drill down and mine the depths of that little phrase in Christ and understand all of the 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 theological depths that Paul was trying to uh, yeah. bring forward with that yeah. with that little phrase. Yeah, I don't think it's any question. You know, um, when when you say that, I get excited too because I think the best definition you can have for a Christian or for someone who uh, is a born again believer is you were to come up to me and ask me, who are you? I say, I'm in Christ. That's what Paul, I think, what, almost 100 times says in the New Testament. That's how he categorizes, identifies himself. I mean, today you can say I'm Christian. That could mean so many different things. But it's a different thing when you say I'm in Christ. Uh, and I, I think it's so good, too, that you mention the mind, too. And being within the spirit of your mind and your feelings and your will, your actions follow your thinking. So if my thinking's wrong, then my feeling will be wrong and my actions will be wrong. Uh, you know, so uh, I have to renew my mind and you never appeal really. Uh, again, I'm a big a student of Martin Lloyd Jones. I've probably read everything he has, but one of the things he, he says is you never appeal to the, um, to the, uh, for salvation. You would never appeal to the will or the emotions first. You always appeal to the mind because it's in the mind that we believe. It's in the mind that we get knowledge of Christ. So we appeal to the mind uh, first. And, and again, if you go to these passages we've been talking about, you know, it's so important that we, uh, because if you get depressed, you get anxious, if it boils right down to it, you, you have the sin of unbelief. You're not trusting God. And so I have to remind myself, I'm, you know, I'm not trusting God. I'm not trusting God, what God says about me and who God is. And so, you know, it's, it's so important to, to see and understand that I, 
Uh, and I have this kind of, I like to picture it this way. It's kind of like a line of scrimmage in my mind. I used to play football years ago when I was much, much younger. And the coach would say, you win or lose the game on the line of scrimmage. And I felt like I got a line of scrimmage in my mind where I can either accept lies or reject lies. I can believe the truth or not believe the truth. And so when I have these wrong thoughts, these stray thoughts, wrong thoughts, uh, I need to reject them. I need to recognize them and reject them. It's kind of a line of scrimmage of my mind, and I need to believe truth. I have to, I have to, I have to do that every day. Mm-hmm. That's preach right. Preach the gospel to myself every day. That's right. Yeah. I, I think, really, if you if you take it all the way back to the garden, you know, what is the first temptation given to man? You know, it's yeah. did God say? You know, it, it it is always a battle for the mind. You know, and I, I think of one of the sins that is just ravaging uh, young people today, the sin of transgenderism. Well, where does that start? Well, it starts in the mind. You know, before there's ever a, a surgery to, to, you know, somehow mutilate their flesh or, or before there's any kind of, you know, cross-dressing or anything of that nature, they've entertained this thought for days, weeks, months, most likely years. And, and they've told themselves over and over, or maybe in some of these cases, sadly, their parents have, have told them, you know, well, I think you, you know, even though you were born Michael and you were a little boy, I think you make a better Michelle, you know? And, and so this, this terrible um, illness, and I don't know what else to call it, but that of transgenderism and, and gender confusion uh, is, is just born out of a ancient, almost Edenic sin from the serpent of did god say well did god call you a boy or a girl or what you know whatever you're well of course he did you know i mean and 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 what more ancient sin is there than to question the very nature of god and 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 then by by so questioning the nature of god of course you question the nature of man and i i had a seminary professor who told me um if you want a book on the best theology read the bible and if you want a book on the best anthropology, read the Bible, you know, because if you really want to know who yeah. God is, read the Bible. If you really want to know who man is, well, then read the Bible. And and I thought, man, what a brilliant statement, because there's nothing that will tell you more about who God is and who we are in relation to who he is than, than, the, than, than the testimony of Holy Scripture. No question about it. And the Bible is the true story of the world. Uh, we only get the true story of the, word, of the world in the Bible. And uh, so, yeah, you know, it, and it's good you point that out, going back to Genesis chapter three was, did God say, did God say this? You know, we were, Debbie and I were listening to something and somebody on the program uh, said um, falsely, uh, you can, we just tell people you can be who you want to be. Uh, you, you know, it's kind of like leading back to the gender question, uh, but you can't just be who you want to be. I can't. I can't be six foot five. I can't because I'm not six foot five. I can't have hair. I don't have any hair. I can say I do. I can identify as I have hair. Now, Corey, I don't want you to tell me I don't have any more hair, but I but I don't. Uh, you know, so it's it's uh, it's silly, uh, but you realize so many people are being uh, are being deceived and falling into the lie of trying to identify them as something they are not, someone they're not. And that just tells you what we know. Everybody is looking to fill a vacuum, a hole within themselves, because we were made to worship and worship God alone. And if we don't worship God, we'll replace something else with God in our life, whether it's transgenderism, whether it's wealth, whatever that is, uh, sex, uh, we're going to replace something with God so we can try to find identity in that or with a group uh, that's finding that identity. So, yeah. Well, again, uh, what well, one of the things that I think because of the transgenderism, pardon me, transgenderism question and all of that really leads to the kind of the hypersexualization of younger and younger and younger and younger children all the time. Um, and, and, you know, Kristen, my wife and I, as you know, our family, of course, our oldest child is eight. We have two younger than that. And I was telling you offline that, that our, our daughter just in about the last month or so had come to my wife and started asking questions about, you know, where do babies come from? And again, that's not uncommon. And and she's getting to the ages where we expected a few questions. What we didn't expect is just how thorough 
and and, and how um, truly curious her mind would be. I mean, they ended up having to have the entire birds and bees talk at eight. And I vividly remember um, that didn't happen for me nearly as young as eight. I, 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 you know, 46, like I said earlier, 46 years old now, eight years old, I wasn't even, that wasn't on my radar. But now children are being so sexualized so quickly, everything on on TV and, and really everywhere else. And again, my children go to Christian school and they go to a, a really strong Christian school. So uh, they're certainly not getting this through public education. They're not getting it, you know, in, in some of the places that some other children are getting it, but they're still getting it. And so I wanted to bring to light, um, uh, this is a book that your wife, Debbie, wrote, and and uh, I think she had a co-author on this, called Don't Awaken Love Until It Pleases. And um, I'll let you briefly talk about what that is, but my wife and my daughter have now been, you know, just starting to go through that. And and it's been a huge resource for my wife, who felt completely ill-prepared to start having this type of conversation this early. Yeah, you know, I, when you talk about having a conversation like that, I uh, never had anybody, and I would say most of us as adults probably never have had parents talk with us about what the Bible says about sex, even as Christian parents. It's kind of a scary subject, it seems, kind of a taboo subject almost in the church. Uh, but you know, it's not to God, because God put a little book in the Bible called the Song of Solomon, uh, which is, he's very open, it's, it's a book to teach us about sexuality between a man and a woman. It's a book that Jewish mothers would use to teach their daughters about sex and sexuality. And God presents it as sex is something beautiful within marriage. And that title of that book, Don't Awaken Love Till It Pleases, is a warning that's given three times in the book of Song of Solomon uh, to young virgins. Don't awaken love. Don't even start in the pro the progression of lovemaking until the right time. That's when you get married. Uh, so Debbie, you know, has this strong burden, as did this uh, her co-author who asked Debbie uh, to come and talk with her and her daughter and some other women about sex and how to talk about that with young girls. And so from that stem this book where that they go into the word of God and talk about from the age, young age, uh, as you said, your daughter's eight, even up to teenage years, up to the time you get married, about giving a mother a guide of how to talk about these issues with their daughters. And I think it's, it's something I haven't seen anywhere else out there, uh, a book like that. And I think it's a very valuable uh, resource for mothers to really have a help beside them uh, to share with their daughters at the right time are the appropriate things to say, going to scripture about how to talk to them about sex and that it's a beautiful thing that God has created. Uh, so, yeah, um, we're excited about this book and what God's going to do with it. No, I agree. I agree. And then real quick, I've, I've got your other books here too. Um, we've got a uh, time for three, which is really a, a kind of daily devotional, right? For, uh, for couples to yeah, work. It's through. a day, a couple's devotional. I need to get you a new copy with a new cover on it, but, but uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, apologies. It no, that's no problem. Uh, it's, it's a, uh, uh, a couple's devotional book and, 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 you know, and it stem from us believing, and I strongly believe one of the most powerful things you can do in your marriage is to have a daily time together in the word of God. And I found most couples don't do that. So uh, we wrote a couple's devotional book years ago. And I realized I got a degree in engineering. Debbie's got a degree in computer science. So writing isn't our thing. I can remember writing this. That's the first, you know, what, we wrote What is a Marriage, which is a, another book we have. But then we got in the, in the Time for Three Couples devotional book. I would write a devotion and give it to Debbie and let her mark it up with my grammar. You know, read with grammar. And then we would send it to an editor. And they'd send it back and market it, you know, and stuff like this. But it was fun. But, uh, you know, devotions that could really help daily a couple have a better marriage, a Christ-centered marriage, and how to have a Christ-centered family. So that's what that was all about. And I also have a podcast uh, called Time for Three that uh, thousands of people have used uh, to try to help people who say, well, sometimes I don't have time to read that devotion in the morning, but I can listen to it on the way to work. And they can listen to this podcast. So it's got a devotion every day of the year on Time for Three podcasts. Excellent. And, and you, you mentioned your, your third book here, what is, uh, what is marriage? So, so this is kind of a copy of that. Uh, yeah, maybe the cover on this one's changed too. My apologies. No, it's, just, it's the same one. It's no problem. I'm just, just kidding you, but. Uh, and then you, you mentioned your podcast. You, you just started a new podcast. Is that correct? 
Yeah, we did called Fortifying Your Family. And basically it's a message or teaching that comes out every Wednesday. Last Wednesday was the first time. Got our next one coming out tomorrow. And uh, but it's a teaching or a message every week on marriage, family, parenting, some issue with family. Uh, um, I have one message. We even mentioned I mentioned the verses in First Timothy chapter one and verse six and seven, where God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. And there's a message coming up that's going to be on there called "What If." What do you do with your what ifs? And uh, so it's a weekly podcast, just another resource that people can go to listen to a weekly message to help strengthen their marriage and family. No, oh, Sam, thank you so much for all the resources that you're putting out there. Uh, before we wrap up here, just tell my audience where they can find you. Kind of, you know, what what media platforms can they find these podcasts? What are your websites? Uh, you talked earlier about the the you know uh, um, the app that you have, and even these resources for for marital premarital counseling. Where can they find all of these great resources? Well, if you want to go to one place, you can go to our ministry website, familyfortress.org, and uh, we have on there links to all of these different. Uh, uh, websites, apps, and everything like this. If you go to any app store, you can look up Family Fortress Ministries and you can pull up the app, download it free. It's full of resources. You can go to any platform that hosts podcasts pretty much in find time for three or fortifying your family. And you can follow us uh, there if you want to do that. We have a YouTube channel, Family Fortress Ministries. Got cops of teaching. Even have a conference there on gender ideology because I've done conferences on that in churches. Uh, you can listen to sessions on that. We have a marriage conference on there called Celebration of Marriage. Uh, it's about 15, 20 sessions. Actually have Journey Through the Song of Solomon, where we've got about 15 sessions going verse by verse through the Song of Solomon on our YouTube channel. So there's a lot of stuff out there. You can find it all, basically, uh, from going to our website, familyfortress.org, and our books. And and uh, you said you are completely funded by support from your from from donors, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for the last 30 some years, actually 40 years in ministry altogether, uh, we've been a faith based ministry. We don't draw salary uh, from anywhere. It's all dependent upon donations of churches that we minister in or churches that support us, individuals that support us monthly. And so it is a faith based ministry. And let me just say, at 69 years old and being in ministry over 40 years, God is so good. Mm. He never has not met our needs. And He has just blessed us beyond what we could imagine. So God has been so good to us. Well, amen. I love I love your testimony of God's faithfulness. Thank you for that. So if our audience, um, say there's a pastor maybe that even watches this, if they wanted to reach out to you and, and talk to you about maybe coming to their church for a, a marriage retreat or a seminar, um, could they do that from your website as well, or even donate if there's someone watching that would like to give to your, to your uh, ministry there? Yeah, they can go to our website. There's a place to donate on our website. Uh, just hit the donate button there. And then there's a place also that out, that outlines the different conferences that we offer. And a pastor can go to that, look at an outline, all the different conferences we do. And they can request through a form there to schedule a meeting or get more information about a meeting right there on our website. Excellent. Excellent. Well, you know, Pastor Wood, I thank you so very much for your time this morning, uh, your your resources and and the fact that, you know, I mean, you've got all these free resources for folks to to enrich their marriage, help them parent their children. Um, certainly, I would imagine the books do have a cost attached to them. But again, as someone who owns all three of them and has went through all three of them, um, or my wife is now going through the third one, uh, it, they I can, I can say from personal experience, they have all been a big blessing in our home and in our lives. Um, and so thank you for all that you and your wife, Debbie, have done all these many years to serve the church, to serve Christ, and and what you're continuing to do. I, I look forward to where God's taking you, this new podcast, Fortifying the Family, and, and uh, eagerly anticipate great things from that. Thank you for coming on this podcast today and answering some questions and just giving some of your wisdom and insight and for just pointing families back to Jesus Christ for all these years. Thank you so much. Oh, man, it's been such a joy to be with you. And uh, Corey, we love you and your family. And, and just thank you for having us. God bless you. God bless. Thanks so much. Well, I hope that that interview with Pastor Sam Wood with Family Fortress Ministries was as much of a blessing for you as it was for me. Again, as we discussed throughout the interview, if you are currently facing any of these types of issues, spiritual depression, your marriage is struggling, you're having difficulty parenting your children in this difficult age that we're in, 
please feel free to reach out to Pastor Sam and to his wife, Debbie, there at Family Fortress Ministries. You can find them at Family Fortress Ministries or familyfortress.org, familyfortress.org. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave me a comment. I can put you in contact with them as well. I also plan on putting some of their links and things in the description of this video that you're watching even now. Thank you again for stopping by. Thank you for spending this kind of time with us here on Civically Minded. If you like what we're doing, don't hesitate to hit like, subscribe, maybe send this to someone that you think it might be beneficial to. And we'll see you again next time on Civically Minded.